So now for our final session of the day and of the conference, I'm excited to introduce our panel discussion on population management and diversity. Our moderator is Embark's own Dr. Adam Boyko, Embark's founder and chief science officer. Thank you, John. It's Welcome, really great Adam. to be here. It's really great to uh, to um, you know be the the wrap up for this wonderful summit. I've learned so much from all the all the speakers and all the discussions and all the uh, all the questions that we've asked. Um, I'm going to get right to it. I want to introduce our panel. Um, we've got some really great people here for uh, discussing breeding strategies and diversity. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Yeah. So I'm going to start. With, yep. No, please do. Hold on. Let me get off, and we'll bring the panelists. Okay, on. That sounds great. So, um, you know, first. Um, uh, Dr. Sophie Liu, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophie Liu. Um, I'm co-founder of the Doberman Diversity Project. So um, the group that gave all that data to Dr. Claire Way to analyze and hopefully start churning out some lovely results that we can start working with. Um, I am a veterinarian in my normal life. That's how I survive. And I'm specializing in behavior and have a particular interest in working dogs. Great, thanks. And uh, Dr. Maggie Cassell. Yeah, I am Maggie Cassell. I am a professor of medical genetics and a veterinarian also um, with a PhD in gene therapy, I guess. Um, but in any case, I, I do a lot of consulting for breeders. Um, I am also board certified in reproduction, so I see the reproductive end of genetics also. Um, so that's what I do. Yeah. And you're at Penn, and we, we, we yeah. get you at Cornell, too, which is great. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Josh Stern. Hi there. I'm Josh Stern. I'm a veterinary cardiologist and geneticist here at the University of California, Davis. Uh, my lab studies inherited heart disease in dogs and cats, primarily, as well as pharmacogenomics and genetics, looking at how individual dog um, genetic makeup may inform their response to certain medications. Um, and along the way, I've done some diversity work in golden retrievers, which are one of my favorite breeds. Great. And last but not least, uh, Amy Llewellyn Zaidi. It's Zaidi. Thank you very much. Uh, I, no, I know. It's easier than it looks. It's all those L's. It throws people off. <laughs> uh, my name is Amy Llewellyn Zaidi, and I'm currently the project director for the harmonization of genetic testing for dogs as part of the International Partnership for Dogs, and I'm formerly the head of health and research for the UK Kennel Club. In both of those roles and in my roles moving forward, my focus tends to be on um, improving education about and access to uh, robust genetic testing and genetic testing information in balance with breed conservation plans and uh, helping breeders, supporting breeders really to make good uh, decisions and choices in moving forward to um, keep the breeds that they, they love. Uh, yeah, and it's such, such an important project and, and it's, it's really great to see the stuff coming out from the harmonization project. So um, so with those introductions, um, I think I'll, I'll jump right in here. Um, so the, the first question I have um, is for Sophie. Uh, as a breeder, veterinarian, and co-founder of the Doberman Diversity Project, are there any unique perspectives you can provide regarding diversity? Yeah, so not a breeder, not yet. Um, oh. <laughs> I think what we've learned is that all of the stakeholders involved in the breed, of any breed, are, they all share a common goal. You know, we may not have the exact same ideas on how to get there, but we have very similar shared common goals. And those are functional dogs that are healthy, that have the potential for longevity, that people enjoy having with them. Um, and so I think that my perspective is that if we could provide everyone with education and guidance and the evidence and the facts to help guide their decisions, we could all get to that shared goal um, more efficiently, and I think with um, a greater focus on what really impacts the health and behavior of our dogs. So my perspective from this is that we approach this from the point of view as um, assessing genetic diversity in Dobermans because as anyone knows, um, their health is in a pretty dismal state. So 
you know, if we could, we approached it from a point of diversity, but at the end of the day, what we are all striving for is we can all better understand what drives health and disease, and we can all make educated decisions about how to achieve our goals while maintaining those basic tenets. So, um, you know, Claire gave a really great presentation about what our, the state of the breed is right now. And so we may be approaching a pretty dire lack of diversity, but it's more than that. It's, it's about creating dogs that we all love and would like to live with and that we can use in the sports or the work that we do and working together to get towards those goals so that everyone can meet, um, you know, creating the type of dog that they want that can live long and be healthy and improve the overall state of the population. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think everybody wants healthy, long-lived dogs. And the fact that there are different lines that have different flavors of traits is, is actually beneficial. Um, but how do, you, how do you create the resources to create the tools and then get the, the education out there um, you know, to, to maximize the ability to breed for health in addition to the physical characteristics that you can see? Yeah, education is a huge piece of it. So having the facts and the evidence, so that's a big piece of our project was getting the preliminary facts and the evidence by testing thousands of Dobermans and then having people like you, Claire, you know, other interested third parties to be able to analyze it and help us answer those questions so that we can have those different flavors, but ultimately still maintain a certain type and health, um, minimum baseline for health. Um, in longevity. So it's been really illuminating. And I think at the end of the day, it comes down to community and education and providing those tools for people because they want them. And there's not many out there right now that are functional and impactful for them to make changes that they want to see. Right. And I, and I think it's so crucial having this database, this genetic repository that, that DDP has worked so hard with Embark to build up. At, that that now can be fed into different research labs and, and, and studied and analyzed and and really move forward um, the research that's needed in order to build um, to, to build out these associations and tools that are needed. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, the next question I have is for for Maggie. Uh, so you work with breeders at the University of Pennsylvania. How do you approach canine diversity and health from a clinical perspective when working with these breeders? So a, a, a long time ago, when all of these genetic tests came up first, you know, looking at diversity, the simpler tests, not, not as sophisticated as they are now, it's like, well, I, I don't think they understood it well enough. But now, now it, it's a combination of both um, educating the breeder that, you know, just because you have a carrier of a specific disease, don't throw that dog away. Just because there's like one thing wrong with him you've got 99% good genes that you really want to promote. Um, if you're looking for a specific standard or a specific type of dog, um, you, should, you should quit with that mindset of throwing away carriers. Um, carriers of specific diseases are not an enemy. They still have a lot of really good genes. And so that's something we've been working on. Having now um, the test like Embark where you get a huge, um, a huge database of information for each dog is really quite helpful now. Um, and and one should not panic over the results. One should take those and we work with the breeders to help them understand the results. And I know you do too, but a lot of times they'll come with the results and say, now what do I do with this? Right. And it's like, use it to your advantage. Use it to make the dog that's appropriate for your breed standard or that you really want out of your dog in the end. It's, it's a it was really a bad mindset for a very long time to take, say like, oh, we got to get rid of all the carriers of disease. No, you've just got to breed wisely. And that's what we help them do a lot. We also provide a service in the sense that they, we have a genetic counseling um, forum where the breeders can actually go to. And, and not only can they get genetic counseling, but they can also report diseases as they see them quite anonymously, doesn't cost them a penny. But if they, if we start to see um, a set breed that all of a sudden we're getting all these reports of microphthalmia or something else, 
you know, we, we can then go and pursue that and look at what may cause that and uh, find genetic testing, which we then can hand over. So right. that's usually what we recommend. And I think that feeds into um, a question that came up for, for Amy. So I want to, I, I think she's the expert here to address it. So, so tests for Mendelian autosomal recessive diseases have opened the door to breeders keeping carriers in their breeding program. They know they can, but now there's this cost of testing for the, those um, litters, the puppies to determine whether they're clear, which ones are carriers. And so breeders trying to avoid that cost are actually not um, uh, breeding carriers and potentially losing diversity. Um, how would you advise breeders on this topic? I think uh, I think a really good way of approaching all of the considerations that a breeder has to undertake when developing a breeding plan or breeding program for their dogs is to firstly think about their investment in a longer term, um, depending on what genetic tests you're undertaking or who you're getting them from, you know, you're talk, it, talking about a couple of bags of luxury dog food levels of cost. It isn't sort of thousands and thousands of dollars in order to undertake this testing. So think about it as an investment in your longer term breeding plans and something that often has a lot of added value to puppy homes and people who are you are um, going to be providing puppies that you're not using breeding stock to. But more importantly than that, looking at uh, the value of uh, knowing your autosomal recessive genetic test results as a progression or a scale of precision in the decisions you're able to make. So when you're looking at uh, g an individual genetic test result, especially for an autosomal recessive condition, you have a lot of confidence in what that result means and how that can be applied to your breeding strategy in a way that isn't there in clinical screening, for example, or even perhaps a precision in the genetic diversity tests, you're not talking about a specific disease or a specific trait. So knowing that information about a specific disease and trait gives you actually a lot of room to be quite, um, quite brave in your breeding choices and quite confident in your breeding choices to find a, a match that will balance any risks that may occur. It's perfectly reasonable to use a carrier in a breeding program because you know who you can breed to to reduce any risks of producing puppies that are affected. And in some cases, depending on the condition and depending on the broader circumstances, you could even use an affected dog, a clinic, uh, genetically affected dog to make mm -hmm. a good breeding decision. And in some cases, you know, depending on your breed, you may not have a lot of options but to use these dogs. The reality is, is there are not going to be fewer genetic tests in the future. There's going to be more. And some of them are going to be le more about assessing risks rather than the precision that we have in recessive genetic tests. So we need to get used as a community, get used to using and integrating these test results in creative and brave and uh, confident ways because you will be making decisions on 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 genetic test results potentially in the future mm -hmm. and not just on one or two. And like and ultimately, people, you know, all dogs are carriers for something. Yeah, we just yeah. don't know the genetics. Exactly. Know. Yeah, we, must, we mustn't be self-conscious about yeah. this or, or have a personal failure if you or, or a concern about that. It's just about being pragmatic and using the information that you have in a most advantageous way. And the beauty of this kind of scale of precision moving from gen a genetic test results all the way through to genetic diversity is that you can have these areas of confidence about what you're choosing. You can be a little bit brave and it gives us a lot more flexibility in balancing what we know with precision, what we're pretty sure about, what we're guessing and, and where we go from there. Right. Well, what I've seen on the on the human side, so so obviously human genetic research is even further along than dog genetic research is. But you can you can take isolated human communities, like for instance Iceland, um, and you know obviously there's lots of carrier traits, and and you know you don't want to be disclosing other people's medical information, and you also like you might be related to somebody and not know it. So so you know Decode has has you know tested basically all of the Iceland population, and you can download an app, and teenagers will actually like bump their phones and see whether they would be like compatible but it doesn't tell you what you're a carrier for but at least it's what you know <laughs> so yeah kind of fun fun thing to imagine maybe sometime we do that with dogs yeah 
Great. And then, um, so Josh, we had a question here too. Um, so as a cardiologist, you work with breeders and pet owners regarding many diseases with high morbidity and mortality. Uh, and you also study how an individual's genetics may impact response to treatment. So how do you see genetic diversity directly impacting these fields? Yeah, thanks, Adam. I think, I think you know, these past few questions have really highlighted that right now what we know genetically is kind of this keyhole perspective about individual diseases that is is really only the tip of the iceberg. And so for me, an example of that um, is um, let's talk about the most common cardiac disease in dogs, which is mitral valve degeneration. It's wildly overrepresented in some breeds like the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, and it's pretty darn common in many other breeds of advanced age. And we know that one of the mainstays of therapy for that disease process includes the use of drugs like ACE inhibitors. So part of our research um, in the past has identified that genes in that pathway um, that ACE inhibitors work on are highly mutable. And we have many mutations within those genes that may actually impact the patient's response to therapy. So then you go and you look at individual populations of dogs. And I mentioned that the Cavalier was overrepresented for that disease. And guess what? They have very little diversity in their mutations surrounding their ACE genes. They're actually almost all mutants for the ACE mutations that we know exist and their response to ACE inhibitors is um, not as robust as other dogs. And so we're starting to see the impact of this reduced diversity on real life problems in the clinic that we didn't know about before. And, and I think we're gonna see a lot more of that as we discover more and more variants that impact not necessarily disease development, but something as simple as the most common medication that one uses to treat a disease. And so I like to think about diversity as you're, you're, every time you make a decision in breeding relative to diversity, you're impacting many, many dogs down the road. And so all other things considered, maintaining diversity is a really good goal in our um, kind of breeding arsenal in order to, to limit the number of things we have to address in the future as potential breed associated disease problems. Right. Yeah, I was talking to a, a colleague a little while ago, and you know, uh, she was interested in doing a Cavalier King Charles, you know, project where let's do genetic mapping and let's see, you know, where are the genes for mitral valve disease. And and my suggestion was, I actually think you want to look at like cavapoos, right? Like you want to have this back cross design because the causal variants may, you know, the the risk predisposing variant may actually be faster. You're not going to be able to, or at such a high frequency that you're not going to get it in, in a in a mapping size within a breed. And so, um, you know, one of the things that excites me about Embark is that, that we actually have multiple ways to address problems rather than just recruiting within purebreds. Many times mixes of that breed are going to be, I think, highly informative for understanding um, the genetic basis and also the genetic interactions that are that are potential. Right. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that that disease process is fixed in the Cavalier, as best I can tell. Um, we tried for a long time to collect normal Cavaliers that didn't have that disease and uh, still still waiting for them to come in. Let's put it that right, way. Right, right. But it, but it may be the case that um, that risk allele is also present in other breeds, but on different genetic backgrounds, it's not as risky. And you can, you can think about ways that we might be able to address this better. And, and you know, certainly there's variable expressivity within Cavalier King Charles. So, so, you know, there is, there is potential, but it's a hard, it's a hard problem. So I have an audience question here for Sophie. Um, how did you start and manage and get all the Doberman owners and breeders to participate in the project and collection of samples? And, and I know I was talking with you and Robin, you know, years ago when this all happened, it's, it's such a cool <laughs> and I'd, I'd love for you to explain it. Um, well, I guess I should start by, I don't think this would have happened if I didn't have um, Adam as my professor in vet school first, because this was pre-embark, and I was interested in Dobermans, and then I actually started looking in the literature in, prepar in preparation for my next Doberman, and I was just, it was a dismal, dismal state. You know, nearly 60% of Dobermans will have a prevalence of DCM in Dobermans. Um, and so I was just shocked that there wasn't a bigger project going on to really address this. 
So I approached Adam, we talked about genetic testing and then Embark happened fortuitously around the same time. So then we developed a relationship with Embark and then myself and Robin Lorth, who's the other co-founder of the project, uh, we just hauled our butts everywhere. We talked to as many people as we could. We, uh, like I said, you have to have a shared goal. So everyone who is involved in the breed, who truly loves them, we all have the same shared goal of having healthy dogs that can live a long life, that can do the work that we want, that we like to live with. And if you approach your community with that, because that is our goal, it's not fake. You know, we are all Doberman owners. That's what we want and need. Um, I think you can build up a community if there is a shared mission. And if you can clearly recruit people, educate and and guide them towards this and know that it's a long-term project it's not something that we intended to finish in three years and fix the breed so um it's a lot of community outreach we did a few talks a few shows but a lot of it is also through social media also so your connections your community social media um shows working trials we did robin actually did go to a working trial in europe and tested a lot of the uh, the winners when they were getting off the podium um and international relationships are really important too that's how we got a lot of our european german dogs so uh, you just gotta get started with someone who sh passionately shares the same vision as you do and start making connections within the community and if your breed suffers from something severe like if we were cavalier people, you know, I would use that. I would explain that based on the evidence, there seems to be fixation, or at least there's fixation of the risk alleles on a cavalier background that makes them really difficult to not develop uh, mitral valve disease. Start with that. You can start with mm, a few key people who are really prominent in the breed and go from there. It's not necessarily something you want to jump straight to a breed club, I think, because we're all just kind of brainstorming and figuring out what might work for us. Um, if there's a few key people that you can connect with, build your community there, get the education out there, get some evidence on your side too, so you know what questions you're trying to answer, and then start. You just got to get started. Great. Uh, we got one uh, question here, I think, for the whole uh, group. In my breed, the Canadian Eskimo dog uh, has an extremely small and limited gene pool uh, with less than 500 registered dogs worldwide. Sure that we maintain proper genetic diversity without eventually bringing our way into a corner. Do we want to jump in on that one? Well, I, I want to clarify because we get questions about these things too. We don't know the effective population size of that breed. Well, I don't, right? So from a population genetics point of view, you should be asking what's the effective population size. And I think doing preliminary analysis and going from there, because if those 500 dogs are extremely um, distinct from one another, they probably have way more genetic diversity than Dobermans, which are thousands and yep. thousands of dogs. I mean, Dobermans are a popular breed, but effective population size wise, it's clearly lower um, and with with land races, a lot of times we do see very high effective population sizes, and so there might be enough diversity there to carefully manage it. But um, yeah, you have to look. Yeah, maybe just stepping a little bit back, but completely agreeing is, with Sophie is find a little bit more information about what genetic diversity actually is existing, or what the effective population size is, and then you'll have maybe some indication of what kind of strategy you might need to go into. Uh, it does, isn't necessarily the physical number of dogs, so that maybe doesn't help things, but uh, if you have some information gathering and get some ideas about what might be f perhaps unique populations or populations that have developed independently of the wider breed that could be utilized, then there could be a lot of different uh, strategies that could be put into place that could kind of help and support. I'm I believe that many people have already talked about being cautious of popular sires, perhaps going along with that, considering using all available healthy, good quality breeding stock and maybe not being afraid of that or feeling like uh, that's, that's somehow bad that you're having to do that. Um, 
the ad, the advice you give to a small effective population size and a small numerical size is going to be drastically different than, you know, large large effective population size or large physical size. So, I right. like to I like to equate that you know Labradors are not snow leopards, so you can uh, afford to be a little bit wild and crazy. But maybe uh, Canadian uh, Eskimo dogs, maybe they're snow leopards. Right. <laughs> Let's find well, out. Another way to look at it, right, is that uh, Basinjis are gained popularity in, in the United States. I mean, there's thousands, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of Basinjis in the United States, but but the Basinji Club of America, you know, clearly you saw that they they were suffering from a lack of diversity. There were very few imports that initially founded the lines, and they've opened up this type book and have been very, I think, thoughtful in how to use the right native bred imported yeah. dogs to inject some diversity but still maintain the characteristics of yeah, that breed. And it's not Project. The otter hounds are another kind of example where they had a double problem in that they are a, a small, numerically small and not particularly diverse, and their populations were separated by geography quite a bit, uh, and they had a number of health concerns that they had to kind of manage and strategize for, and the successes that they have been able to have achieve is by looking at it much more in a global um, genetic stock view rather than a local and embracing uh, the use of I think I've heard the term not traditionally bred um, otter hounds that were in working essentially working lines or working hounds in, in France that hadn't been tapped into yet by the show community so they had to get quite creative but they had like three dogs so you know you just gotta you gotta do what you can do if you want to conserve these breeds. Especially if two of them don't like each other, then it's just... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so this kind of leads into the the next question that we um, got in. Um, can Can you explain how reopening stud books and or starting an outcross project can be beneficial to a breed with a small gene pool and or high average inbreeding coefficient, and how to get the breed clubs and the kennel clubs on board with this idea? I think it's the second half of that question maybe is more difficult than the first half. <laughs> I can say one thing about that, Adam. I think um, I think there's something that obviously helps in this in this plight to, to think about, which is if there's evidence in your breed about reduced diversity, and in particular any evidence about diversity and disease, that would go a long way um, to helping move people or move the needle towards this being a good idea. And so I think, you know, thinking about gathering some basic information about what um, what the actual diversity looks like in your breed, like we just discussed, and then looking at diseases of interest in the breed and whether diversity is impacting those would be a good a good place for a breed group's health and genetics committee to, to start. Yeah, I think selection on two levels could be a big consideration here. If you're uh, if you're wanting to increase diversity just for the sake of increasing diversity, there's an argument for that. It's a way of an insurance policy for breeding away from the future. But probably you're a breed that's in a situation where you have a one or two or maybe more specific health concerns that you can't manage within the population that you're currently working with. And having that information and having the support of uh, veterinarians and genetic advisors to give you that guidance is really key. And I actually think the biggest hurdle is a breed getting to the point where they're willing to have conversations about outcrossing and hopefully see that as just another resource and option and strategy to help uh, retain the breed that they, they're interested in and that's important to them and not some kind of uh, breed failure or disaster that they've had to resort to an, an outcross of some description. So getting the, the open-mindedness and the willingness to explore a, a potentially extremely useful and valuable strategy for a breed uh, is half the battle, particularly if you have that support of precision in, in the kind of uh, health information or the disease concerns that can motivate perhaps more reluctant members of the community or the breed clubs or the kennel clubs 
my only uh, to my mind experience example is uh, in the Dalmatians. I think in the mid seventies there were uh, obviously major concerns about uraic stones. I'm seeing lots of nodding. So if someone knows more about this, there's please jump one. in. Yeah, <laughs> but but their their challenge is that they only kind of used one or two dogs in their diversity program. So don't do that. <laughs> but the concept was that they had this this concern and they were brave about taking. Uh, a strategy to kind of um, breed away from that in, through an outcrossing program. Uh, and uh, while that was a good start, let's let's consider that uh, with more genetic advice to the future so you're not using one or two stud dogs. <laughs> there, there was another breed club in Finland, I think, who uh, there was a, I don't remember what the issue was, I think it was cataracts or something, um, for the German pinchers in Finland. And that breed club allowed the outcross of a schnauzer or standard schnauzer. Um, but again, I think it was only one or two dogs that they outcrossed yeah. in. So, um, you know, if people are going to do it, again, going back to what the evidence is, I think there was that simulation. You all would know better than me, <laughs> but that looked at the, the benefits of outcrossing are essentially lost, I think, after four generations um, of backcrossing. Mm -hmm. So, Again, if people are going to do it, I think they should do it with the guidance of counselors like Maggie, for example. I don't know if you have real uh, world experience specifically with this, but it would be a fallacy to think that it's just crossing to, you know, a Doberman, to a Schnauzer one or two times and everything is safe. Right. right. No, it's, a, it's something that definitely would need to be carefully considered um, and, and clearly it needs to be done in certain cases. I, I guess I would advocate that all breeds should be monitoring genetic diversity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think out is the solution for most breeds. I think most breeds are fine and you should be monitoring genetic diversity. And if you're able to maintain your diversity and you're able to select for, for health without losing diversity. So each generation we're, we're seeing just as much diversity, you know, as. But if once the COI start going up, that's sort of your warning sign. Like, hey, there's something going on in the breed. We're not, we either don't have the diversity or we're not breeding in the right way to maintain the diversity that we have. And if you're looking at that at the genetic level before maybe it becomes a crisis of epic proportions, that's when you should have the conversation, right? Because it's much easier to have the conversation before it's a crisis and before drastic changes have to be made. Like you have time at this point, you can carefully consider an outcross program that uses multiple individuals and are monitored for, you know, genetic conditions, health conditions before they get more widely crossed into the breed. And you can and, and you can set up that ahead of time. So you're not being as reactive. But if you're not measuring genetic diversity over time so that you're getting that kind of like red light going off in the cockpit, hey, ground approaching, ground approaching. If you can make small corrections on the yoke before you have to like pull up and you know pull the parachute on the plane, that's that's what you want to do. I think people are realizing that now. Uh, there's a study out of Britain where they looked at um, the diversity in different dog breeds uh, across many many dog breeds over time. And while in the 60s and 70s it was a disaster for many breeds, there was the, a complete lack of diversity. And then they started really looking into that. And so by 20, uh, I'd like to say by 2000, it starts going, the, the, the whole curve starts flattening out, like where people realize we, we have to pay attention to this. Now with testing, it it's actually makes it a lot easier to, to check for diversity. But that's when I think around 2000 or 2005, people started realizing this is something we need to go back and look at simple pedigrees and look at how many how many are related how closely are these dogs related and i think that's also when some of the breeds started realizing like uh oh we've gone too far and so right. i think yeah and now with newer testing it makes it a lot easier to pay attention to diversity not just looking at pedigrees but having that as an adjunct now yeah i mean what i'm particularly excited about is uh you know we're not looking at pedigree based coi anymore we're looking at genomic coi and there's this whole research area we can even follow up on in that there might be certain parts of the genome where inbreeding is more harmful than other parts of the genome and we can get even more detailed than coi and we can actually like start to compute inbreeding depression um which would which would be you know fantastic um and and i think it'd be pretty unique so there's there's lots of potential areas for research in this 
Um, so we have another question. Uh, how would we maintain the health of our lines uh, during outcrossing to lower inbreeding coefficients? That's sort of a related question we'll be discussing. What do they mean? Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. do they mean by maintaining the health yeah. of their lines? Do they mean the type that they're interested in, as in like physical type, or maybe maybe that's not maybe that's I, yeah, I, I, yeah 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 it's it's uh, I, I don't know if it's the I mean obviously if you're outcrossing to a line with different characteristics you're going to have a different type and then you have to sort of select to maintain the characters that you want. Um, you know, it may also be sometimes if if you do have you know very different lines. Um, genetic traits in one line might not be compatible with the other line. And so it is, I, you know, I, I would think like you would want to pay attention historically, have these lines been crossed before, were those healthy or not? Um, you, 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 it, so if there is any of that kind of data, otherwise, you know, if there's not, and this is a new experimental cross, you know, I would, I would definitely make sure you are health checking the parents, genetically tech checking the parents and then monitoring um, the letters that are created to, to, you know, is this something that we want to continue doing or are there red flags here and maybe different outcrosses we want to do? Yeah, I think yeah. for overarching, oh, sorry, do you want to, do you want to go Sophie or? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think this question is pretty well answered by a lot of what the guide dog schools have done also because the guide dog schools are kind of unencumbered by um, a lot of our restraints, they have full control over everything. They can bring in whoever they want as long as it meets certain criteria and breed and track those dogs. So they have the phenotypes to follow up on all of their dogs and many of them have been genotyped um, as well. So, you know, I think tracking health, you would just have to, you know, going back to what we said about having your lines of evidence. So what are your lines of evidence that this dog is healthy? Are they the pen hip spores, OFA spores? Uh, surf, is it cardiac health? So for our breed, have they been echoed and holtered until they're dead? Um, tracking cancer rates and all of that. So if you're going to ask about health, I think it helps to have a baseline of what do you define as healthy for your breed? And for us, that's gonna be echoes and holters until the day they die, um, tracking cancers as well and stuff like that. So I think if you can track those, just like the guide dog schools have with like hip scoring, for example, that will allow you to make judgments and decisions, but it is going to be something that happens over time. Yeah, I think just as a, an overarching, having an in-depth knowledge of the breed or breeds that you're considering outcrossing to is what's important and to try to focus on what is going to balance and counterbalance any challenges that you're having in your specific breed. As a general rule of thumb, you're probably more likely to find something similar but different enough if you're staying within kind of clusters of your breed types but ultimately it will be on a breed by breed or breed basis that you're going to have to be making these considerations um maybe that's the thing that makes outcrossing kind of scary to people are, is is that they're thinking you're just sort of picking a random dog or a random breed when when it would require much more consideration than that and and much more thought about not just the health challenges or benefits that you're trying to achieve, but also how it kind of will complement and fit reasonably with the physical type and behavioral type so that you're not having to spend so much work uh, getting back to the breed kind of look and behaviors that you're interested in. So you're probably wanting to find something that's sort of in the world of, of your breed, whatever that breed happens to be, you know, terrier to terrier, or just I'm being very simplistic, but rather than terrier to something else. I think you but just it'll... answered one of the other questions. Um, Did I? <laughs> from, from Alaska, how can genomic test results be used to assist in the genetic rescue of a very rare bloodline with unacceptably high uh, COI and kinship. And, and, I, and I think that's hitting it directly on, on the head is you want to, you want to find something outside of this narrow bloodline, but not too outside. Yeah. Of find narrow, a cousin. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. find, find your friendly cousin. Yeah. Right. So we don't as, want as rule Canadian Eskimo dogs getting across to poodles, even though the poodles had a great run one year in, uh, in the I did run. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, other sorts of related, yeah. you know, Make, yeah, yeah, make it easy on yourself. Try not to go too too crazy. And this is where having an a specialist come in and provide that support and advice. If you if you are a Doberman person, if there's something that's 
kind of like a Doberman, but doesn't have a heart condition, you know, I'd start looking there. I wouldn't look a million breeds away from there. I would just. Right. But we can see from the Doberman graph, I mean, there is a lot of diversity there in that PCA. I was so just, I'm just picking you know, you here. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, certainly you can use PCA type things, all right? Like you can mm -hmm. identify a whole bunch of related sled dogs and you can see which yeah. ones are close to the the line that you're trying to rescue but mm -hmm. they're not so close that it's adding coi right like so they, they don't have the the line breeding it's not it's not creating inbreeding so it's an outcrossing but it's from highly related genetic stock yeah and and there's sometimes a little bit of a cultural element that can be, be utilized so i had a very memorable meeting with the fci and they were talking about what's a breed and what's not a breed and there were conversations and no one will be surprised maybe to hear that there is a white mountain dog for every mountainous country. And and to an untrained eye, they don't look wildly different from each other, <laughs> but their populations are probably relatively distant because they just haven't haven't met in that way. So right. looking at, like I, I jokingly call them the cousins, but looking at your friends that are nearby, your breed friends that are nearby, it might be a good place to start. Unless of course they're sharing the same challenges that you are. Right. And I think in conservation, you, you know, so conservationists have a much harder time because many times you're working with an endangered species and there's not, mm -hmm. you know, like dogs are not endangered, right? So you, you always have an opportunity to outcross to save it, but we don't want to do like these massive outcrosses. But in species where you have different subpopulations, it's usually mm -hmm. either identifying a closely related subpopulation that can inject diversity into your subpopulation or a subpopulation that may or may not be genetically High, the the closest, but ha is is shares some sort of environmental challenge that it's adapted to that you're trying to get in, and, and you have both of those considerations that you can make. Yeah. Um, there's one question. That looks like for me, are Embark tests breed specific, or do you want to, or do you run all the tests, and the breeder has to scroll through what's important for their breed? So it's it's uh it's sort of both. We run all the tests, but we we top line is these are the breed relevant conditions. Bottom line is these are all the other things that we happen to look at in your dog. So you don't have to you don't have to scroll through a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. You, you get highlighted what what is um, relevant for your breed. And we rely a lot on the work of of people like Amy that that helps keep us honest about what the research is and which tests truly are um, you know relevant for different breeds. And some of that is ongoing research, and we try to contribute to that too. Um, there's a question for Dr. Stern. Uh, is there any research to see if there is a genetic correlation on susceptibility to diet related DCM? Uh, sure. So, so there's ongoing research in that area. Actually, I, I think, Adam, you can maybe speak to that a little bit. Yeah, we, we're working with Hills and you and uh, if people yeah. are very interested in that study. But what I would say is, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, there may be some common genetic factor that could make a dog more susceptible when exposed to a specific diet type or something about that diet. Um, but, um, but we don't yet know what those things are and it's not simple and Mendelian. I mean, we've done, we've done some pretty basic um, looks to see if what we know in Goldens as nutritionally mediated DCM is heritable. And um, the, the association analysis looked like a shotgun plot. There was absolutely nothing of interest there. And so, I think if we're looking for this, it's going to be something that is uh, a susceptibility factor or risk factor that um, might pop up with lots and lots of dogs. And I think our friends at Hills and uh, Embark are working on that pretty diligently from what I understand. So I'll use this opportunity as another call out for that project. If you have a dog that has been uh, veterinarily diagnosed with DCM, there, there's echocardiogram data or whatever, um, you know, please uh, reach out. We project that we are um, that we are recruiting for and we would love to oversubscribe that so we have the power to actually answer these questions in, in, in a statistically scientifically valid strong way absolutely and report them to the FDA please right <laughs> um, I think this one's for me do you have any suggestions for how to use genetic COI in encouraging breed clubs as a whole to make general reading recommendations that support retaining and building better diversity. So if the COI is 20% on average, should we be looking at a recommending uh, target COI threshold in individual breedings? Are there other ways to use this? 
Um, maybe other people have have other ideas. I mean, it, it definitely looks like it's a linear relationship, and so there's not a, it's not a threshold sort of thing. It's just one piece of information that goes into evaluating a breeding decision, and it's not the thing that should be um, minimum. Minim it's not like the one thing that you should be shooting to minimize in a breeding. There's all sorts of other genetic tests, other health tests, other characteristics and temperaments that you're looking for, um, you know, in the litter. But it's important that it is something that you're monitoring. And because in some cases, if you are going to create a litter that's going to have a higher than average COI for the breed, you might want to reconsider, is there another cross I can do that's going to create a lower one? And if we can, if we can substitute out those, you know, top 20% COI litters and change them out to get a bottom 20% COI litter, that's actually going to drive overall health in the breed, and it's going to actually help maintain um, diversity because you're you you're not getting these sort of like bottlenecks that are accelerating with inbreeding the drift. Yeah, I would say as low as you can go without losing the benefits of the specific genetic tests and clinical screening as part of your breeding program. For me, if I'm recommending to a breed as a whole, the genetic diversity is your insurance policy to be able to breed away from problems that will inevitably occur in the future as you're starting to decrease genetic diversity. And for a specific person's breeding lines, it's kind of a micro version of that. You know your dogs, you know your lines, you probably know the lines that you're going to be breeding to how low can you go while still maintaining the the type and the behaviors and the health aspects that you have known and and precise uh, estimations for great i i would also make a big plug for ebvs so estimated breeding values we desperately need them to be widely used more frequently in dogs um you know our project is working on creating um, DCM EBVs, ideally, so right. that instead of just eyeballing a pedigree, and you know, we can try finding patterns, but we are a human brain, we're not a statistical method. So if we can get a, for example, dilated cardiomyopathy estimated breeding value, then you can truly see, you know, what is the value of the dog that you have on hand, and how does it compare with your outcross dog on hand, and you can do this for anything. And in the UK, I think they've done it through pedigree EBVs for hip, maybe elbow? Hip uh, and elbow. Hip and elbow. Mm -hmm. And I think that the guiding eyes for the blind, I think also did pedigree EBV for mm -hmm. hips. And right. they dramatically improved their overall population to OFA. Right, and for some phenotypes, you know, like hip and elbows, where, where you know the phenotype of the individual before a breeding decision is made, you you can definitely, with pedigree-based EVBs, make significant progress. For other phenotypes that are more late onset or, or you know maybe are only one sex or the other, there I think genetically informed breeding values are going to be what's going to be crucial. Yeah. So are we looking forward to Embark coming up with genomic breeding values for our I, favorite I, complex I, I mean, diseases? I mean, it would be, it would be good. We, we definitely have scientists on the team that, that are chopping at the, at the bit to do that. But, it, you know, it's a matter of really making sure the, the model is implemented yeah, the in a way. And then it's going to be another, you know, it'll be another area of, of education um, mm -hmm. and which breed clubs um, can embrace it and, and which one, you know, doesn't really help their breeding decisions. Uh, and the last question, audience... I, know oh, I know we're running low on time. I just want to get to the, the last couple uh, questions here. Um, all right. Is anybody working on research regarding epilepsy? I'll take that one. <laughs> okay, um, great. So, so I actually, this is a plug for me. Um, I have been looking at epilepsy and Irish wolfhounds for uh, pretty much forever. Um, we've done some studies, but we can always use more samples. So it kind of depends on the breed. Um, we're starting to work with Lagotto. Breeders also like with the Romagnolo. Um, but uh, for the largest part, I would say the University of Missouri, um, that group has been working on most of the epilepsies. So so if, if your breed is not an Irish wolfhound or a Lagotto, then um, I would turn to the University of Missouri. Nice. Yeah, we've we've got it looks like over three hundred uh, diagnosed epilepsy cases from the annual health survey uh, that was just completed 
I'm not seeing any Irish wolfhounds I can give you though, unfortunately, Maggie. Because yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to talk about that mapping project that you. That I know you've been doing it for years. I saw some of the early need to finish US the, the huge linkage interval, and we need we need more dogs to break that down. All right, and then we have a question here for uh, for Josh. Your research focus is on heart disease. How do you address consistent phenotyping? I had one cardiologist diagnose my dog differently from another. Uh, that's a great question. I think I think there's a lot of shades of gray in heart disease, and as cardiologists, um, we we try really hard to keep the equivocal zone of disease wide but not everybody subscribes to the same cutoffs for what that equivocal zone of disease is. And an animal's physiology makes a huge difference as well in what they look like on day one compared to day three. So for example, the most quintessential example I can think of is subaortic stenosis where um, the cutoff value for diagnosis is not standardized across uh, all cardiologists. And so, you know, any cardiologist can look at a dog that has moderate to severe SAS and say, that's moderate to severe SAS. But I have looked at, let's say, a thousand golden retrievers. And so I feel very comfortable with what's normal in a golden retriever, whereas somebody else might look at a young, excited golden retriever and say, oh, this is equivocal. I don't think this is just excitement. And so, so how, do we, how do we get it standardized? Um, well, I think we need to push for genetic testing that can help us with that plight. And so searching for genetic variants that are clearly associated with disease will help us segregate out animals that are really at risk for cardiovascular disease versus those that are just excited young idiots that can remain in the breeding program and get cleared a year later. I think the same goes for Dobermans, for example, with DCM. There's a lot of Dobermans out there that have just a slightly reduced systolic function, and is that normal for them, or is that the early onset of DCM? Who knows? But if we could do something and, and we can screen them for genetic factors that we know are clearly associated with disease, that would help everybody from having to hang on to those dogs and repeat all of that testing next year. And so I think the answer is research, um, and I don't think it's a perfect answer, but if you're working within a specific breed group, you might contemplate finding a cardiologist that's very experienced in your breed um, because there are those of us that specialize in different diseases because they will be the most informed about what normal might really look like in your breed. And yeah, I, I'd like to add to that. that it really, it, you have to find a person who does that kind of investigation in your breed and, and is very familiar with the disease you're looking at. And we look at We've been investigating renal dysplasia in Cairn Terriers also for a while, and um, it really matters who does the ultrasound on the dog. Uh, it, you have to have almost a board-certified ultrasonographer doing it. They have to know what we're looking for because there are very subtle differences between the dogs, and one that I would say is mildly affected but will never develop disease in its entire lifetime but it is mildly affected and that matters. And so once we have genetic testing, I think that will be really helpful. But until then, it, yeah, pick somebody who, who is very familiar with your breed and what you're looking for. I think that's really important. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, we got one more question here. Um, we are looking for dogs of the shepherds of the Himalayas with an eye towards increasing genetic diversity and preservation of these dogs that are similar in appearance, temperament, and purpose. Will it be possible to test individual dogs to see if they're related before we breed them? So yes, I mean, that's one of the, you know, the, the, the things that we do at Embark is you can, you can, you can look at, so, so related dogs are going to, in the matchmaker, produce a litter CY that's elevated, um, or in the relative finder, they're gonna show up as, as uh, relatives of each other. And so I definitely recommend before embarking on the conservation program, uh, to check and see what you have and see, you know, are there related individuals and, and uh, manage your breedings that way rather than just assuming like everybody is uh, unrelated at the first generation, which is the assumption that goes into pedigree COI, which we know is not, uh, not correct. All right. Are there any other um, last comments that anybody wants to give? I know we're running out of, um, out of time here and I want to give people one last chance to say anything that's on their mind. 
Um, if you have a Doberman and you're watching this, we really, really want to get the dilated cardiomyopathy estimated breeding value off the ground. So um, as it's been mentioned a couple times, the phenotype of the dog matters a lot. So all those health screenings that people do, that conscientious owners do, that breeders do, so OFA hip screening, pen hips, serve uh, echoes and halters until the day your dog dies. Those are all super important for our breed and for other breeds, I think people should really pay attention to what health afflictions matter the most for them. So for golden retrievers, keeping a track on the cancers, cancer rates, getting a formal diagnosis and collecting that into a repository of some sort if they can so that people can use these for more powerful breeding tools in the future through estimated breeding values. So if I could leave people with one thing, it's collect all your data so that you can use it functionally in the future to really impact the next generation. Um, so keep track of all of those things that create high morbidity and mortality so that for the future, people will have something to work with. Yeah, that's great advice. And I'm definitely looking forward to, to more collaboration with DDP and, uh, and using the, the phenotypic databases and the genetic databases to drive this research forward. Yeah, and I'll I'll add I'll add to that that yeah, if you have any any uh, Irish wolfhounds with epilepsy, any Cairn terriers with renal dysplasia, and any any type of genetic skin disease that has not been defined yet, um, that we've been working on that for quite a while as well. Um, but no, it really matters. I'd like to just add on what Sophie said. You, it's it's really important to collect all the data that you have, and and when you're starting a breeding program. You know, make sure you have all the health testing done. All the breeders I work with, when they come to me with a problem, it's they've already done all of the health testing that is suggested for the breed. That's really important, and and uh, and then we can go from there. I, yeah, just collect as much data as you can, and and go to somebody who wants to help you um, and wants to figure this out. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I think. I, I speak for Josh too when I say if your dog has uh, DCM, but definitely please enroll it in the in the study because we would love to. We've got a few hundred dogs, and we, we really want to get that up to a thousand. Yeah. I would I just, just add. Oh, no, sorry. Please. <laughs> I would just say uh, for me, in closing. You know, I would consider genetic diversity kind of the the test for the future of the breed. And while it may not seem like the most important decision making piece for you in your individual litter. When we think about what we don't yet know, this is really the way that we're going to protect ourselves and have somewhere to go without forcing ourselves to open up stud books. And so I think, you know, consider diversity now while you still have the opportunity. Um, and, and that might, might really help all of us in the future. And just to kind of supporting and confirming with what my colleagues have said, if you are someone who wants to know what genetic tests or what clinical screening are important for your breed in your uh -oh. We almost made it through it <laughs> for me. We'll, we'll see if she comes back, but we might have to hold that thought. But I, I mean, I know um, yeah, Embark is one of the founding supporter members of the for genetic testing in dogs, uh, you know, project, and, and they have resources that they've been building out and, you know, they would love to help educate um, breeders of all different kinds of breed clubs, you know, what testing, both genetic and health testing is is recommended, what, what research projects are going on, um, you know, for the breed. And so I definitely encourage people to uh, check out their website and the resources that they've been building there. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, panel. I really appreciate it. Um, it was very, uh, very educational. All right. Well, thanks so much again, Adam. That was a, that was really a great discussion.